Hi, I'm Jennifer Zollett. And I'm Larkin Bell. Welcome to our podcast, A Female Lens. Today, we're talking with Elizabeth Chomko, writer-director of What They Had, which was her first feature film that just was released in 2018. We had the privilege of seeing it at Sundance, and it was incredible. She blew us away. Mm -hmm. We're also discussing our favorite moments of 2018 related to women in film in the news and why that's making us excited for 2019. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. first segment women in film in the news in which we talk about um an article or a moment or anything really that's happening that has to do with women in film in the news uh at the end of the year we kind of checked out a bunch of end of year lists and wanted to kind of reflect on what had happened in 2018 and kind of see what has made us really excited for 2019 yeah so we found this list from women in Hollywood that we really loved, and we're going to talk about a couple of things that excited us on that list. Definitely. Um, the first one that really pumped us up was Greta Gerwig becoming the fifth woman nominated for a Best Director Academy Award. Um, this was an awesome moment, I think, for a lot of women in film, just to see her being recognized for her work and for her fantastic film, Lady Bird. Yeah. We were both blown away by it. Loved it. Went to an all-girls high school, so really, <laughs> really resonated. Yep. Um, it's just nuts that there have only been five women nominated. Uh-huh. Since 1929, when oh, the Academy the Awards started. Ah, yeah, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so while we're really excited that she was nominated, we're also like, okay, we got to still keep working to... Yeah get more women in that category promote them definitely and really support them um and I just also think it was great that the story that she told Mm -hmm. was so relatable just to everybody but also it was from a truly female perspective about this relationship between a mother and her daughter totally and yeah and I remember thinking I think we had had a conversation about Lady Bird after we saw it how the the character of Lady Bird is as, as a character we just don't see on screen. Yeah. She's just so unapologetically herself. Right, living this like authentic <laughs> life as yeah. a teenager and finding herself. Yeah, and I thought that was that was really powerful for me to see on screen. Hundred percent. Since we're talking about the Academy Awards, mm-hmm. last year Rachel Morrison became the first ever woman nominated for Best Cinematography at the Oscars. Yeah, which is mind blowing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know that there weren't any women that were nominated either. for cinematography. I just Shame, shamefully naively online. had yeah, okay. never really thought about who's literally behind the camera. Yeah. Um, who's controlling the vision that we see and how incredible that she was nominated. And then she went on to direct, or not direct, uh, DP mm. Black Panther. Oh, that's right. Which is the first Marvel film with a female cin- cinematographer. Wow. And You're that's killing it with these facts. Um, yeah, that is nuts. And also I think that really, when that happened, we're, we, I think we talked about it where we Mm -hmm. were committed to really exploring like, yeah, what does that mean to have a woman on the other side of the camera and capturing these moments that have been captured for so long by men? Mm -hmm. Completely. Also just have to throw this out. I Mm -hmm. loved her Instagram post that went viral of her pregnant with her camera and just basically saying women can do it and there's no there's no excuse and she's doing what she loves and she's pregnant yeah and now she's a mom and that's pretty incredible yeah another huge moment of 2018 i think would be hbo hiring intimacy coordinators Mm. to work on its shows yeah uh for those that don't know an intimacy coordinator is someone who basically make sure that the actors involved in scenes of a sexual nature are comfortable they're kind of like the communication mm-hmm. coordinator between, like a mediator yeah between the actors and the director mm-hmm. and the crew and just making sure everyone's comfortable and, right. and kind of knows what's expected of the scene and yeah. everyone's on the same page um crazy that this didn't occur or this wasn't a thing before insane yeah. Um, I mean, stunt coordinators have been around for yeah. you know since stunt the beginning coordinators choreographers you know it's just fascinating Mm -hmm. and i again had not even thought about that before it's just like it's in the script and actors expected to do it but 
you don't even know exactly what's expected of you as an actor. Right. Um, it's just sort of like there's this thing written. You're supposed to just go do it. And then you're on the set. There's pressure, time, money, everything, and this expectation to just do something. Yeah. And there's no way for you to really have a voice and say, like, oh, hey, I'm uncomfortable. Or even ask a question. Like, what really am I supposed to do here? Totally. So. Yeah. And I think we found out about this through listening to an interview with Maggie Gyllenhaal. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talked about her work on the deuce and what she produces yeah. and also stars in, but, um, she really fought for the intimacy coordinator to be a part of the show mm-hmm. and to continue to be a part of the show. And as a producer, she used that power to be like, no, we need, we need that. And also, um, I think kind of helped like show HBO that they needed this on, on other shows too. Yeah. So I think that was a, there's so much in this moment. Mm-hmm. I think that's powerful moving forward, but right. I think, yeah, just the idea that they're going to be on set and, mm-hmm. and hoping to, like, be... Yeah, you know. provide protection and safety, like, both physically and psychologically totally. for actors. And I think this moment shows what happens when women are in positions of authority and mm-hmm. power in which they get to make those calls. Right. In which she did. So, yeah, that was exciting. Another thing that happened yeah. was uh, the inclusion writer yes. became a huge thing in 2018, or at least we became aware of it, really, mm-hmm. especially after Frances McDormand announced it in her acceptance speech at the Academy Awards last year. Yes. And the inclusion writer is basically um, a provision in an actor or filmmaker's contract that... Uh, it, like, specifies requires, how many yeah. people of like minorities or or other in different parts uh and different jobs Mm -hmm. on the on the set yeah it sort of mandates that they need to be inclusive yeah in their hiring practices both like in cast and crew yes yes which hadn't been done before yeah she really brought that to the forefront Mm -hmm. and um by doing so really highlighted the annenberg um inclusion initiative thank you yeah which has been doing so many amazing studies um analyzing and examining women and minorities in film on screen off screen Mm -hmm. um and helping to get them a lot of attention and and focus in this new year and it's just sort of that idea that knowledge is power the more we know about the inequality and the actual statistics i think the easier it is to say oh look there really does need to be a change because look at the numbers totally and on that note um the uh, one of the most incredible moments of 2018 mm-hmm. i would say is ava duvernay signing a hundred million dollar deal with warner brothers yeah that was so exciting for Super so many reasons amazing she's incredible mm-hmm. and i think such um an inspiration of just lo- teaching herself learning mm-hmm. hustling and, and making it happen which is incredible also she's such um a fierce supporter of other women directors and minority directors Mm -hmm. and i know she's committed to like giving jobs to people completely that have not gotten those jobs before she's really setting a standard and she definitely doesn't even need an inclusion writer because she's doing such a good job of just making that part of her her career um she really hires across the board minorities and women and I learned that uh, for her show Queen Sugar, oh, which yeah. has had three seasons, yes. she's had female directors for every episode, yes. and that's awesome. Yeah. I feel like someone was trying to give her flack for that, and like, why? this is reverse uh-huh. discrimination. No. She's like, no, look at the numbers. Yeah. Like, It's been so much in the other way for yeah. so long. She's like, I don't care. Yeah. I'm going to just she was like, doing this. <laughs> Sue me. Like, I'll take yeah. this to court. <laughs> um, uh, long live yeah. Ava. She's incredible. Yeah. I think those were pretty... Yeah, those Amazing are huge. Moments. And yeah. I think they're really telling for mm-hmm. an incredible year coming up. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think there is hope yeah. and we can keep going. Completely. And I think it's also sort of setting the tone, hopefully, for this year. All these things that changed last year, even though it's, you know, some of them are just small steps forward. They are steps forward and steps in a direction of change. Yes. Hey, Larkin, you know what pairs really well with the Female Lens podcast? Ooh, What? Uh, wine. Duh. Yes. <laughs> We're so excited to be sponsored by Vinovore, a wine and good shop with a focus on female winemakers located in Los Angeles, California. It's one of our fave spots in L.A. 
In addition to specialty wines, including organic, biodynamic, and natural options, Vinavor also offers the exclusive Wine Pack Wine Club, where members receive in-store discounts and choices of monthly wine packages starting at $35 per month. Mm, Yes. To support female winemakers, head over to the store in Los Angeles and pick up a fun bottle of wine like their Nasty Woman Progress Pink Rosé, or check out their website at vino-vor.com. That's vino-vor.com. And now we're so excited to share with you our conversation with writer-director Elizabeth Chomko. We discovered your work when we watched the premiere of What They Had at Sundance, and we were so blown away by you in the film. You've also mentioned that you had a similarly inspiring experience watching the screening of Once the first time you went to Sundance. Could you talk about what that full circle moment was like for you when you premiered your own film at the festival? Yes, I did see Once in at the Sundance Film Festival, which I think was in 2006, and I went there really arbitrarily. Um, and I... I grew up watching MGM musicals and Judy Garland and Shirley Temple and and um, I just I don't think I'd ever I didn't realize that a, a musical could be that truthful and that s- simple and that beautifully real and I was so moved by it that I was like I was weeping throughout the movie and 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 my dad was there randomly was part of this arbitrary reason that I was at Sundance that year and and he looked, he just kept thinking that I was absolutely out of my mind because I was, it's not a very sad movie, right? But I was really very emotional and afterward couldn't stop crying. <laughs> and I think the way that, that I, uh, that I th- think about that now is just that my heart, I wanted to be part of making movies like that so badly that my heart was breaking. And that was a real discovery, kind of like a, 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 a moment of, um, a moment of, of profound change um for me and and um so to then but I didn't ever think in that moment that I would be there with my own film I don't know what I thought but I didn't think that that would ever happen so to be there um with what they had which was just you know one of those moments where you can't you you think you're gonna wake up you know you think you're dreaming it was really a a profound experience. You mentioned that you wrote the initial script for what they had in just a few days. Once you got the initial story written, can you walk us through the process of refining and rewriting the script? I did write the first draft very quickly, like three days, I think. And once I figured out where I was going, it took me a second to sort of get into it. But and and then at that point, I just I was just chasing this thing. I just didn't want it to go. I was just so worried I would lose it that I just had to get it down. And I didn't write write it for any to make the movie or to do anything with the screenplay. I wrote it very much because I, I just felt compelled to. I just and writing them, talking, my grandparents. It was inspired by them, and it was like spending more time with them. And so once that happened, I sent it to my mom, and she. Um, was not as excited about it as I thought she would be, um, which was actually very helpful because it forced me to have to really reckon with the fact that it that it wasn't very good, and I couldn't put my family on the page and not really make it what they deserved, make it as good as they deserved. Um, at that point, I just rewrote it and rewrote it many times and. And the doing of that was, there were so many different ways, like different tactics I tried to figure out where to go next with it, what the next draft should look like. I would send it to friends and get their input. I would send it to my mother and she would, she ended up being a wonderful sounding board and she was taking care of her mother at that time. And so she really um, helped tremendously just in terms of filling in some of the pieces about Alzheimer's and, you know, um, I one of the best things was taking some time away like putting it away and then reading other screenplays and watching other movies and just living life and coming back to it like four weeks later with very fresh eyes and reading it through and being like oh my god this is terrible I have to start you know that was one of the most helpful things I think Um, so yeah it was a long process and then rewriting it after the Sundance Lab and rewriting it once we cast had our cast and and then once we got into Chicago and once I we had locations that that all needed things needed to be tweaked and rewritten throughout and then of course editing is like a whole new 
um, as we were just talking about, a whole new rewriting process. What was your experience at the Sundance Institute Screenwriting Lab like? It's it's an amazing um, experience. You're there with wonderful mentors, people that are your heroes, and they've all read your script many times and are very familiar with it. And you meet with six of them, um, three-hour meetings, blocks of meetings, and they all have a different approach um, in, in how they are there to, to help, and they all have different opinions and different you know, ideas about what to do with your, with your script and how to shoot it or what to do with the re- rewrite or, you know, um, and so it's at once extraordinarily helpful, even just to engage with, with uh, artists who are that much further along, I think, in terms of how they're t- talking about and how they're thinking about uh, filmmaking. Um, it's very helpful, but it's also really overwhelming. And so you leave and you're just like, your head is swimming with possibility. I think one of the most important things that I took out of the lab was learning learning to the, the importance of your internal compass, of which notes are really the best for what it is that you're trying to do with your film, what the story is that you're telling for your particular voice, um, trying to really discover and hone that compass. What experiences with directing film did you have before doing what they have had? I didn't have much experience directing film. I had done, at once I wrote the screenplay and I decided, okay, well, I, I don't think that this should just live on my computer and I am going to direct it myself because I'm not done with it and I'm not gonna give it to anyone else. Um, then it became about trying to figure out how to, how to direct. And I was an actor, and I'd done, you know, a fair enough of I don't know, not enough, but I, I had done some, you know, television and film work, and I'd always was always asking, whenever you know how it is, it's like hurry up and wait, and so I would always go up to the, you know, whoever was there, and be like, hey, what do you do here, and get the scoop on what the key grip does, and um, so th- that was helpful. I did direct a, a wrote and directed a, 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 a little short that I that I shot that was relatively simple. I shot it at our at our house for the most part. Um, and that was interesting, very interesting, very informative. And um, that was it. I, sh- you know, I shadowed some wonderful directors who were willing to let me be the annoying pest. And, and that was, that was it. I think it's a really learn by doing, at least it was for me. The story obviously was so personal to you and, and you had been with it for so long. How did you then communicate that vision of the story and how you wanted to visually look to your cinematographer? Well, I had a wonderful cinematographer, um, Roberto Schaefer. He uh, had a lot of experience doing a lot of different things. And I didn't know much about the technical aspects of cinematography. I didn't really know lenses that well. I didn't really know um, just the, you know, the the right words for camera moves and um, things like that. So it was a very, it was about showing him what I was after and, and developing that aesthetic together, describing it and looking at reference materials, art, other films, things like that. And I think that's a, a much easier way to communicate, especially if you don't have a command of, of that vocabulary. Um, and he really was very intuitive about about that. He really was a wonderful listener, and um, I learned a lot from Roberto. What elements in the script changed during production? There were things that changed, yes. Um, a, a lot of it was timing, it was just time, like days amount of days so I I had a lot of the transitional pieces um we had to cut just little nothing that was anything that was not essential to the story we had to let go of I think um because we just had such a limited a really short shoot we shot it in 22 days and so that was that was the big thing the other big change was um certainly like the weather we had some challenges with because it takes place in the snowstorm that's how it starts and then it's these five days after the snowstorm so and in chicago you know we're in we were shooting in chicago but 
it, we didn't actually get to know for this. And, you know, there's no way to really change that. Um, so a lot of it was like, shooting around they're like how do we get just a number we'll just dress this like 10 foot radius and you know and um uh that that was a big aspect and things that we had initially thought we'll shoot outside we couldn't because of the snow and things like that um and the last piece was geographical once locations we found locations a lot of it takes place in that one condo and there were very specific stage directions about moving around the building and the vestibule area and they're stuck and she doesn't know the code and and so once i it was written differently a little bit differently in, in the script and then once i found that location it was kind of about re just rejiggering the the things that there was a couple things that we added you know just inspired by what we found on the day like oh let's let's shoot this if we have time and let's grab this and um uh so yes it was some changes yeah quite a bit of changes i guess yeah i guess we're curious you know you spend so much time you know investing all this energy into this story and then you get to create it and you then put it out and then like how do you feel now that it's coming to an end almost, but not really since it is, you know, going to be able, you know, people will be able to access it still. But that, that a feeling, I just feel like it's so particular and I'm curious if you're feeling anything. Yeah, I think it is very unique uh, to, in a way to get, really feel like you birth this thing and you work on it for so long and it really, be, it lives inside of you for so long and, then you open it up and share it with everyone and you suddenly have this new family of actors and crew and um and location like it just feels like you're this family birthing this baby and then you birth it and then you give it away and it's sort of like you just it's like that first day I don't know I don't have children yet but I um it's like this that first day I, I would imagine of preschool or kindergarten or whatever and you just are sort of standing there like holding the fence as you watch your kids go into the playground and face everybody else and face the world and you know you just sort of hope that it doesn't you know that it survives and that it doesn't get beat up too badly and that it finds where it belongs in the world and who is meant to be touched by it um it's a very strange um feeling but you know, I, I think it's, you're ready. I was ready to, I wasn't, I was done. Like it was a long journey and it was a very personal journey of letting go. What a beautiful thing to be able to let go at my own pace, but um, gr of grief, like it was about grief and be able to kind of hang on to pieces of them. So it's a beautiful thing, um, but it's, you know, it's just making a film feels like so much, you have to have so much control and then suddenly you have none anymore. And that's, you know, that's, it's funny. You have a background in theater, playwriting, acting, and music. How do you find all of those feeding into your filmmaking? Well, I, yes, I was an actor and I, I, I'm a, I play the piano and do a little composing and um, I, I have a background in visual, visual art as well. I always loved um, painting and um, drawing and photography so and then uh, and then I was a writer f from a young age I never felt quite at home in any of one of those things I never really felt like I c could felt like an actor I never really I just never I loved writing plays but I it was always about the process of writing um, which was always over too soon and so certainly being a director these things are all essential um, and I, I found them all, it suddenly made sense why I, I loved all these different things and never quite felt at home in one of them. And the, all of it, I don't know. I think, I, I think that every director probably brings to it whatever makes sense for them. Um, but for me, certainly like the music aspect is in the rhythm of the dialogue. And of course, in the tone of the film, which is so dependent on the composing and, you know, the music and, um, and the pace of it and uh, certainly as an actor to be able to kind of, for me, it was like acting alongside of them in a way, like going through the the emotions as, as they were doing them just so that I, you know, I was, I felt I could understand whether or not we got it, you know. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it was, it's, I don't know. For me, this was all very essential. What would you say is the most, or was the most surprising part of your first feature film directorial experience? I think the biggest surprise, other than how hard it was every day um, and how little you sleep, um, I think the biggest, the thing, the biggest surprise was just sort of how managerial it was, you know, that you really are a referee in a way. Um, the decisions, some of the decisions you have to make, especially when the budget is small, is like, of course, everyone wants the resource for their department, you know, and you want to be able to offer the cost and people enough money to really dress them beautifully and the light, you know, you want to offer the DP enough time to really light it well. And, but of course you want, you know, your actor to have enough takes to get it. And, um, you know, it's, uh, when there's a finite amount of resources and everyone is vying for them because that's their job, it's, it's a lot of having to sort of be the referee about that. And, give one to one person one day and a little more to this and depending on how the story is and you know and to be the bad guy sometimes um and so I, I think that was that was a surprise just feeling like a manager a lot you're currently writing an adaptation of the novel after perfect we read the book and it did seem very cinematic how did you start the process of translating the book into a visual story I'm still in the process of that, but um, I was doing that today. And um, I, for this, you know, we developed this uh, with some of the other collaborators. So I kind of knew what, where to start based on those conversations and, um, and what we all were wanting to do with the story. It, it, for me, it was about, it's kind of always about the emotional uh, through line which is what to hang the film on you know what is the main relationship and how does it arc through the course of the story and then f that's where for me I, I think I start as a writer and then these the other pieces kind of come once I get that arc kind of figured out the other the cinematic pieces and in a story like this there's a lot of stuff right there's a lot of this is about a, a, you know a woman sort of reckoning with her privilege and having to, you know, when you shed away growing up with so many things and when you shed away those things, what else is, what is there? What is really there? So there's a lot of that visual um, part of the story that I think will develop more as, as you know, with the director and, and with um, that feels like stuff that's coming in later, later drafts. I, I mean, it's coming now, but this is, I'm on a, been working on this for a while so both what they had and after perfect center around these family relationships and family dynamics is family a theme you're committed to exploring in your work or has it just been these stories that have really excited you or both well I love movies about family but I think that can be so many things like Boogie Nights is one of my favorite movies about family you know a dysfunctional group of people that find family I think when you write with family or people who are like family, there's you don't have to be quite be so polite, um, which I, I find exciting. But I'm not committed to to writing about family exclusively. I think this is these are just the two things that the stories that kind of called me called to me. Uh, working in a creative field often means earning your income elsewhere. We're curious, what have been your other survival jobs? Um, I've done a number of things. I w waited tables for a long time. I am a certified sommelier, and I no way. and I, and I, <laughs> I am, and I was a sommelier for a while, um, which is where I met my husband. And um, I have done a lot of transcribing. You know, I was not very good at it, but I, <laughs> you know, transcribing uh, like somebody's talking and yeah. or like this interview and yeah. then you type out what people actually said um i have done some of that i have worked in paing and sets and i was casting a, i was a reader for a play um casting a play i got fired um after the first day so um yes i have done i guess i've done a number of things when starting out you're often told to find a community of people that inspires you where have you found that community for yourself? 
my family inspires me a lot. I'm really inspired by my mom is a very emotionally uh, wise person. And so that always gives me great inspiration to talk with her just about how people work and emotions and um, dynamics and relationships. And um, in terms of there, but it is, I think it's been very important to have a, a community of people that get what we're doing and get it and understand and can kind of be soundboards and demystify parts of the business for us. And I certainly, that was also one of the great things that came out of the Sundance Lab was was meeting our fellow fellows, our fellow, um, you know, our fellow lab, lab mates. And we've all stayed quite, a lot of us have stayed quite close and it's a little community that you have that you never goes away. And, and that's a huge, uh, wonderful resource. And the Nickel Fellowship, the same with those, that community of people. Um, and there's, you know, just filmmakers that I've engaged with over the years in various capacities, like worked with them before or, um, or uh, you know, you just sort of end up running in these circles, bumping into each other, like through the WGA and things like that. So, and that's been really great to have, to have those people. And, and you know, you, for me, it was like, we've, I've kind of crafted a small group of people that I really trust and that's been great yeah what is your vision for the future and what would you like to accomplish well I don't have a big vision for the future I wish I did but I just want to be able to do to enjoy what I'm doing and I want to you know work on things that are meaningful to me that feel worth my time and worth my you know worth worth the days that I spend on this earth right so I don't have any real ambition about a specific genre or a specific budget level or I just want to tell the stories that feel like they're calling me to to be the one to tell them and I, I'm hoping that people want to let me do that we end every interview with our rapid response segment called three two one action okay you can just answer a word or a phrase or a sentence whatever okay you'd like. i'm not great at that okay i'm not great at one word i'm, I'm a bit verbose but i will okay. do this i will and it will be great okay um great so number three your favorite most influential exciting film that comes to mind right now there's many but today i will say tootsie two dream person you want to work with lynn ramsey one best advice you've ever received be fearless action what are you most looking forward to right now i'm most looking forward to uh i really am digging where things are at in terms of women um really supporting each other and really valuing each other's work and kind of building each other up and and standing up for each other in a way that i think is is more meaningful than ever and i'm really excited about what that means for all of us and for all of the world at large like i just think that's it's an exciting time for for people who for everybody that everybody's so engaged with that there's this transsectional approach to um getting stories that haven't been heard before and voices that haven't been heard before out into the world and how what do those stories actually look like and what are they how are they different from the things that we've seen and heard in the past and how are they the same so i'm excited about that uh where could people follow you on social media i i do have an instagram that i try to uh with with relative regularity update and i'd love for people to follow me at elizabeth tromko great thank you so thank much you. for chatting with us thank you for having me it was an honor you can find us at afemalelens.com and at afemalelens on Instagram and Twitter. You can email us at afemalelens at gmail.com. And you can download the show anywhere you listen to podcasts and on Apple Podcasts, where we'd love it if you left us a review. Our theme song was composed by Jesse Nelson. Our logos are by Megan Cafferty. This podcast is produced by Jennifer Zollett and Larkin Bell. <laughs>